welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. I'm a, anybody ready for the word of the Lord? I, I believe there's a really neat thing that we need to get to tonight that God's going to move us into a new direction. God's going to do some great things in your heart as well as on mine. I need to have my heart prepared. You know, I haven't come to hear from a man, never go to church to hear from a man, never go to church to hear from a woman. You always go to church to hear from the teacher of the church. That's the Holy Spirit. So God wants to speak something into your life so that when you walk out of this place, man, you're saying to yourself, I have just had an encounter. I've had an experience with God. I mean, who cares about what, can I just ask you a question? Who gives a flip about what men have to say? I want to know what God has to say and uh, how to make it in my life. And so let's just go with the attitude that God's going to speak into the depths of your heart. There's something God wants to say inside of you tonight as you walk out of this place that'll change you, that will, mm, are you believing that when you come into the house of God, I tell you, every time you go to church, you ought to believe that the impact is so great from the, from the word of the Lord that you will never be the same. That's the way I believe it. I believe God speaks to each and every one of us. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. Come on, stand to your feet and let's go before the Lord. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. We've already worshiped. We've already praised God. We're just excited, Lord, about your presence in this house. Where your presence is, there's your power. And we just say, welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us. Encourage us, guide us, guard us. Direct us and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, give you the glory, give you all the honor. Now, Lord, as you bless us tonight, we are very grateful for that. But we want you to bless every church that's preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest, Oak Valley and Oasis and Linland Christian Center. The Assemblies of God, Four Square Denomination. Thank you for Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist. Thank you for Ecclesia. We thank you, Father, for the way. We bless you, Lord, for San Bernardino Temple. We ask you to bless our Catholic brothers and Adventist brothers and sisters. Lord, at no time do we see ourselves as better than them, but we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field, building one kingdom, not a man's, no, no, but yours. May all the praise and glory of the churches gathering all over the world this night to celebrate you, may it go to you exclusively. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say, Amen. Amen. As you take your seat, get your Bible, go with me to Matthew, the 13th chapter, and just open it to Matthew in the 13th chapter. I want to talk to you about something recently I just heard, and I The Spirit of the Lord spoke to me about something very important that all of us need to enter into. Recently, I was listening to the growth and the report of a world religion. A world religion that was growing faster than any other religion on the planet is not the Christian faith. Doesn't make it right. Doesn't make it wrong. What makes things right and what makes things wrong is Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ is not in the middle of it, and it's not about Jesus, then it's wrong. I don't care what anybody says. You can say anything you want to say. You can be as frustrated as you want to be. You can want to get, you know, some kind of message that incorporates everybody. But I want you to know when Jesus comes on the scene, he is the way, the truth, and the life. The Bible makes it very clear that no one goes to the Father except by him. The thing that so impressed me about this world religion and its growth that's even taking over in America, you go ahead and figure it out who it is, is the fact that it was growing and it was stunning to me that it was growing because I can't even imagine anybody getting involved in that, especially women. And yet at the same time with this growth, to find out the reasons behind it, listen to this, 
was really fascinating. The reasons for its growth was the commitment of its people. In other words, people saw it and said, man, these people are so committed, there must be something there. These people are so entrenched that they're willing to lay their life down for something, then therefore they're starting to people a look and see, what is it that somebody would lay their life down for? Even though it's wrong, even though it's not right, can you imagine laying your life down for something that's wrong? That's terrible, but laying your life down for something that's right, now that's pretty cool. But here we find that religion is growing in vast ways all over the planet. Because people's deep commitment of consecration, which is an interesting word, it's a, if you will, the title of tonight's message is Consecration Movement. The word consecration means a devotion of the heart, a commitment of the soul and the will and desire of the man. And as far as I'm concerned, those that are born of the Spirit of God ought to be more consecrated than anybody on the planet. Those that have the truth ought to be more excited and more deeply committed to the truth than anybody on the planet. People who have the truth shouldn't be lukewarm in their walk, shouldn't be half in and half out, but should be literally consecrated to the place where we that have the truth of the word of God become a witness to a lost and dying world about our Savior and his name is Jesus. We are of Jesus. We are in the world, but the Bible says we're not of the world. So we're here to stay. We're here to do. We're here to have families. We're here to run businesses. We're here to have children. We're here to bring love. But you know what? Even though while we are here, we are in Christ Jesus. And that commitment to Christ Jesus has got to be wholehearted with everything that we have. God has never, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, ever asked the people to be lukewarm. In fact, he rebukes those that are lukewarm and says they're not going to make it to the kingdom of God in the book of Revelation. And God is saying to each and every one of us that we need to, from time to time, consecrate ourselves to the things of the Lord because we have a tendency to let stuff in that pollutes our commitment to God. Let me say that again. We have a tendency to let stuff in that pollutes our commitment to God. I see it over and over again. People come into the altar and their, their tears are running down their face and they're in love with the Lord and make a great commitment. And six, eight months later, the stuff comes in from the world and pressures of life and trials and all the things that come in and all of a sudden, that which they believed and were committed to at one time no longer becomes a commitment and becomes the routine. And every one of us that are in here need to renew our commitment on a regular basis. It's not that you're not saved and it's not that I'm making a commitment to get saved. I'm making a commitment of all of my heart because I want to consecrate everything and I want to remind myself that I am committed to the king of glory, the one whose tomb is empty, who seats at a sitting at the right hand of the father. His name is Jesus. And when I come into the house of God, one of the purposes of coming into the house of God is for that time of consecration unto the Lord. You know, this coming Wednesday night, we're having a communion service. Don't have a communion service with God without a consecration time where you make that consecration of all of your heart and all of your soul, all of your will and all of your desires. That's the only way to love the God who went to the cross for you and I. And I just want to remind us tonight how important it is from time to time to refresh our commitment of consecration and make that consecration that's the real one, the real movement in our own hearts. Go with me if I haven't already said it to the 13th chapter of Matthew. In the 13th chapter of Matthew, I'm going to read some verses, the words of Jesus. He makes a statement that's kind of fascinating, I find, and I'll put it up on the overhead for you, those of you that didn't bring your Bible. I'm, I'm out of the New King James. Those of you that have your iPads, you can go to the NIV and you can go to the uh, Amplified and you can go to the Message and 
man, they're really powerful. But may I just say this out of the New King James, it's pretty powerful by itself. Matthew 13, chapter, verse number 24. Jesus is speaking and he says these words, another parable he put forth to them, speaking of his disciples, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. I want you to know something. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, you made a commitment to do that. And you put good seed inside of you. You didn't get saved except someone told you about Jesus. Someone came along and told you about the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ and, well, you just believed it. And you took the word of the Lord that you heard and you put it inside of your heart. The Bible refers that to that all through the scriptures as good seed that's sown in good ground. It's in the heart. Something funny comes along and he makes this kind of a statement afterwards, if you will. Verse number 25. And I love this little word, but. It's a transitional word. It really means that something's going to take place. You, you heard the word of God. You sowed the good seed in your heart. He says, but something happens. In verse number 25, while men slept. You ought to underline in your Bible, but while men slept. What is he just describing when people are not paying attention? Have you ever slept and you know what something else is going on in the house? You never even knew it. You slept right through it. Why? Because your mind was somewhere else? No, your mind was blank. Your mind wasn't filled with what was going on around you or you'd be awake. Your mind was filled with something else. You were somewhere else. And he says, but while men slept, and I, I, I hope, John, you can just go ahead and, if you would, highlight those uh, four words for me. While men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And all of a sudden, I just can translate this to a lot of different situations. We can translate this to the church. We can translate it to a group of people. We can translate it even to an individual. While we're not paying attention, while we're not really checking ourselves, while we're really relaxing in our own comfort zone, all of a sudden the enemy comes. I want you to know something. That's when the enemy does come. It's when we're not paying attention because you know if we were paying attention, we wouldn't let him come. I mean, who would let the enemy come in and sow something else in our life if we were paying attention? So he waits until we're brain dead. He waits until we're dumb. He waits until we're doing something else. Waits until our commitment that used to be yesterday, a commitment of consecration, is no longer a commitment of consecration. The wheat that was sown in the field in good ground is no longer sown. Now there's a tear in there. The word tear means a product that looks just like wheat but isn't. A tear means this, it's a product that's sold that actually grows among the wheat. It looks just like wheat until harvest time and then it is poison. And you can reap the wheat, but if you get the tares mixed into the wheat, it'll poison you. In other words, you'll find that what he's describing here is either purity or nothing. And you're going to see something in just a moment with all of us. We're going to have to make some, some kind of a step up to keep on going. His enemy came and sowed tares. And the word tares, if we could, John, highlight the word tares there. It means that which looks just like wheat. Yeah. But it isn't wheat. It's actually poison among the weak. And then he went his way. In other words, he just planted it. He planted it in the minds and in the hearts sometimes of us. And we got all burned out about the world. We got all frustrated about our lives. We got all discouraged about our families. We get all, you know, out of sync with God because people don't treat us right. Things don't go the way they ought to go. Our prayers aren't being answered immediately like we want and need them to be answered immediately. So we get all bent out of shape about God, who he is and what God's doing. And he says these words, he sows those tears in our hearts, those things that'll poison the whole existence 
of the farm and ruin the entire crop. You and I have got to be smart enough not to let those times come when things can be sown in our hearts that cause us to really water down our relationship with God. Then he comes along in verse number 26 and he says this, but when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop and then the tares also appeared, verse number 27, so the servants of the owner came and said to him, sir, did you not sow good seed in your fields? Of course, the answer to that, to the owner, is of course I did. Watch this. And how then does it have tares? Verse number 28. And he said to them, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? And he said, no, least while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Oftentimes there's tares sown in the church. Oftentimes there's people that you will find in any congregation in America that look like Christians, that act like Christians sometimes, that raise their hands to God and sing songs to God. And then you get alone with them and you talk to them and man, they got demons hanging off of them like bats. And if you've gone to any church in San Bernardino, you can say a big amen to that. And you wonder what in the world is that? Is that what a Christian is all about? I'm here to tell you something. Listen closely. There are tares among the wheat. And oftentimes the wisdom is if you ought to get those tares out of here, let's get them out. But God makes it very clear. Don't get them out like that because when you get them out, they'll pull a whole lot of good people out with them. And now you got the good people out there being hurt at the same time. So this can not only be on a personal basis where we're sleeping and allowing the tares to be sown in our heart, but also corporately in a church. The wisdom is let God deal with it because there's a time coming. And then it says in verse number 30, let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them but gather the wheat into my barn. I want you to know something. God's called you to be the wheat. God hadn't called you to be a tear. You end up as a tear as you allow stuff to come into your heart that you should not allow, where you're dealing with things you shouldn't be dealing with. You're hanging around people you shouldn't hang around with. You're talking about things you ought not to be talking about, and you know it. You're doing stuff you ought not to be doing. Let me tell you something. You will be influenced and become what you hang around with. If you're hanging around a turned on Christian, you will find yourself staying turned on all the time. But if you hang around somebody who's compromised, it won't be long before you are compromised. It won't be long before your tears so grow that it destroys and kills your family, kills your children, kills your marriage, kills your relationship, kills you of your job because you allow the tears to come in. So we don't need to be people who are sleeping. We don't need to be people who are brain dead, if you will, and just say, well, whatever. Guess what? There's a time when we need to watch who we are, where we're at, who we're with, what we're doing, so the tears don't come in and keep us from the blessings of ending up in the storehouse of God. I love the word of the Lord. Moses is talking you remember the story how Moses goes up to the mountain and when he comes back down the mountain, he's got the, the tabernacles of stone. And he comes down, the children of Israel have been waiting for him and they're frustrated because he's been up there for so long. You know, and all of a sudden he comes down and when he comes down, the children of Israel, what do they do? They're, they've taken all the gold and they've got a hold of Aaron and they made a golden calf. Do you remember that? And they started to worship. And here's what they said. It was really interesting. Listen to this. They said, this golden calf is the God who rescued us from the Egyptian army. Have you ever thought about that? Here's the God they're worshiping, the right God they're worshiping, who rescued them from the Egyptian army, but the wrong way to worship the right God, and they end up in trouble. Let me tell you something. 
The wrong way to worship the right God is to make a golden image and call him a cow. It's not what this is about. God's not a golden image. He's not some cow. He's not something made by hands of man. He's God Almighty that sits on the throne. And so they came along and said, oh, this is the God that just formed itself out of nothing and comes up and he's the God. He, they try to lay this lie on Moses. But let me tell you something. When someone's been with God, he knows exactly what's going on. Moses doesn't buy it for a moment. And of course, Moses gets frustrated, makes the children of Israel grind up the golden calf and eat it. Let me tell you something, that had to be a heavy meal. And all of a sudden, God is talking to Moses about what the people need to do next. Now that they've messed up, what should they do? For some of you that are in here, May I say this to you? Listen closely to what God says to Moses to tell the people of Israel. Listen closely. If you will, go with me in Exodus in the 32nd chapter. Exodus 32, we're talking about consecration. In Exodus, the 32nd chapter, verse number 29, Moses said to the people, these words, highlight, if you will, John, the word consecrate yourself today. Moses says, consecrate yourself today to the Lord, that he may bestow on you a blessing this day, for every man has opposed his son and his brother. In other words, we've, they just got through fighting against that which was wrong. They've opposed those things that were wrong, and now God says, now it's time to consecrate. Set your heart aside. Set your life aside. Set your feelings aside. Set your com commitments aside. And go on with God. And that's what God is saying today. You may be born of the Spirit of God headed for heaven. You may not have any pressures in your life. You may live in America, have food on your table and a roof over your head and everything seems pretty good, but the bottom line, if we're asleep in our relationship with God, I'm telling you, tares will be sown into our relationship with God to the place where it will destroy a relationship and keep us from the blessings that God has. And here were these people. God had done great things for them. God had loved them. God was committed to them. God brought them out of the bondage of Israel, uh, Egypt and brought them into a place where he was going to take them into the promised land. They have absolutely gone against God. God overlooks it. God looks the other way and says, listen, now that you're on the right track, consecrate yourself. It's so fascinating to us. This relationship that we have with God can't be a lukewarm relationship. It can't be something you do every now and then. It isn't something you attend on Sunday. Can I just say that again to you? It isn't something that you attend on Sunday. The relationship that I'm talking about with God is every day, every hour of every day, day in, day out. It's a commitment from your heart to God with every bit of your being. God says, you will love me with all of your heart and with all of your life and with all of your soul and with all of your being. God's looking for a people like that. I'm telling you, when you have that kind of a commitment, the world looks at you like you're nuts, but there's other people that are looking at you saying, I don't know what you got, but I want what you got. Because deep down inside every man, there's a hunger for God. Is anybody listening? It's true. I love what the word of the Lord says in 1 Chronicles where David was helping his son Solomon build the house of God. Really powerful. In 1 Chronicles, the 29th chapter, 1 Chronicles, the 29th chapter, and verse number five. And David set aside from his own personal wealth. This David amazes me. He's given like a trillion dollars in today's money to build the house of God. His son Solomon is coming over. He's an old man now. And he's made, the hand of God is on him, and he's made a ton of money. He is literally the Bill Gates of Israel. 
probably of the known world. And he takes his finances and he gives them to the commission that God gave his son to build the house of God. He brings in all this gold and he brings in all this silver. Have you ever wondered where he got it? He's the king. What kind of a king is there that is so wealthy that he is the lead giver in everything that's going to take place? He's the first and the greatest and the biggest giver. He's the one that goes out before everybody else, this King David. And from his own treasury of gold and silver, he brings in to his son Solomon's uh, plan to build the house of God. Fascinating. And then when he brings this in, he makes a statement. I want you to read the statement with me. It's found in the 29th chapter of 1 Chronicles in verse number 5. The gold for things of gold. In other words, I'm giving the gold there for the things of gold. Silver for the things of silver. In other words, I'm giving the silver and there for the things of silver. Now watch this, you can come into the house of God and you can give your money and say, this is for the things of God. This is for feeding the poor. I'm giving to build the kingdom of God. And you can give your money and it's for the things of God. It's for the house of God. It's for the, it's for the poor. It's for those that are in need. You can do that. But there's something else that God's looking for that's far greater than just the gold or the silver that you can bring into the house of God. The greatest thing you can bring into the house of God is your heart of consecration unto the Lord. Without that, my friends, it doesn't work. So listen to what he says, and I love this. Gold for the silver things and silver for the silver things and for all kinds of work to be done by the hands of craftsmen who then is willing to consecrate himself this day to the Lord. He says, listen, I'm bringing it, the gold for the gold and the silver for the silver, but who, what people among you are ready to consecrate themselves to the Lord? They already had a relationship with God. They already served the word of the Lord. They already went into the temple. They already believed God. They already had some kind of a physical real. And here he comes along and he makes a statement that where you're at is not where you need to be. Where you need to be is consecrated unto the Lord. And he wants to know, are you willing to do that? For every one of us tonight, it calls us to a place, are we willing to continuously consecrate ourselves to the Lord. Some of you used to be turned on. You're not turned on as much as you used to be. And you know people who used to be turned on, but today are not turned on as much as they used to be. Some of you used to come on Wednesday nights, and now you don't come on Wednesday nights anymore. Some of you used to come on three, four, five times a week and sit on the front row. Now you're sitting on the back row. What's that all about? Could it be that there's been tears that have been sown into your heart? Could it be that that relationship with God is not as committed as it used to be? Could it be that some Somewhere along the line, something's stumbling you and stumbling you to keep you from that. And are you willing to be consecrated unto the Lord? Well, that's the Old Testament. Let me take you, if I may, into Psalms. Listen to what the, excuse me, in Proverbs, in the 23rd chapter of Proverbs. Let's describe what it's like. Proverbs 23, verse number 26. My son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. I really believe without the giving of the heart, your eyes will never see what God has for you. And that's the tragedy. We want God to lead us. We want God to speak to us. We want to hear from God, want to see God move in a mighty way, want to see the works of God, the power of God, want to see the healing of God. But I want you to know something. I don't think we see anywhere near until the whole heart is giving to God. When the whole heart's giving to God, you may look a little weird to the world. You may look a little strange to your friends. Your family may reject you, but I'm here to tell you something. Listen to what God wants to move mightily in your life and in your future. And I don't think you'll ever see until you're our heart is committed. Consecration. 
That's the Old Testament. New Testament, that's where we live. That's where the word of the Lord is written for us today. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as oftentimes Paul, Peter, James, and John wrote to us in the scriptures. What does the New Testament say about consecration? May I take you to Romans in the 12th chapter? Today it's the same thing. Hasn't changed. God's always looking for somebody who's so consecrated they're not asleep. Because they're not asleep, they find themselves in a place where there's no tears sown in their heart and their heart stays pure and committed on to the Lord. In Romans, the 12th chapter, take a look at verse number one with me. I beseech you, brethren, obviously talking to the church. Nobody can say any different than that. I beseech you. See the word beseech, John, if you could. John, by the way, in case you're wondering who John is, John's not the Holy Spirit. John's in the back room running all of this that goes on the board. So I'm saying, who's John? I mean, he keeps talking to John, and the letters change up there. John is my buddy in the back room. I beseech you. See the word beseech. The word beseech means I beg you. Now, if this is the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says that all scripture is given by inspiration. Therefore, what you're reading there is an inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, if it comes from the Holy Spirit, it's got to be God speaking to you and God speaking to me. And the word beseech means I beg you. I've often said it like this. If God showed up in your living room and sat you down on your couch and said, I'm going to beg you to do something, you'd say to God, God, I don't want you to beg me to do anything. Just ask me. I'll do whatever you say. No, he says, I want to beg you because it's so important. And that's what we're seeing here in this scripture. God is begging those that are born of the Spirit of God. Why? Because at times we can get lazy in our walk with God. At times we can just take God for granted. At times we need to, you know what Paul writes to Timothy, stir yourself up. At times we need to stir ourselves up in our relationship with God. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, that you present your bodies, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice is an interesting word. It's like sacrifices, giving up something for the betterment of someone else, something you want, something you need, something you desire, something you have. And I like what I have and want and need. I've got it, but I'm going to give it up for you. Now God says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself a living, something that you are alive to, not dead in. You know, we can make an offer to God that's dead. We can make an offer to God that's just meaningless. We can bring to God something that has no life to it. But he says, a living sacrifice. In other words, this cost you something you feel. This this, this is costing you you. This is, co- this is not some lukewarm, just get by, safe little relationship with God. God's in the heavens and I'm down here. He loves me, oh, how he loves me. And you sing that song, but you really don't love him enough to keep the word of God. You don't love him enough to go to church. You don't love him enough to study the word. You don't love him enough to pray and bring him into your heartbeat. You don't love him enough to be there. My goodness sakes, we're talking about consecration. He says, present yourself a living sacrifice. I'm alive. It's easy if I was dead. If I was offering something and just gave my life to something, it's over with. But if I have to live in the sacrifice, I have to live in something that I want. You know what I want that you want? You want your flesh. 
You want your way. So do I. You want your thinking. You want your feelings. We all do. That's why we're all overweight. That's why we all, if you will, do what we do. My goodness, we want what we want. We got what we get. Guess what I'm saying to you? You got to live in the sacrifice that you gave yourself to God Almighty and you offered yourself up to him. He says, and how holy acceptable to God. Holy means separate. Holy means consecrated to God. Means exclusively is. Wow. Which is your outstanding commitment? No. Reasonable service. That's the most bizarre verse I've ever seen. Well, it shook my life when I realized that God's asking me to give up myself consecrate myself to him. Give up what I want for what he wants. Give up my feelings for his feelings. Give up my desire for his desire. Give up my ways for his ways. Give up everything for him. And then he comes along, instead of putting a premium on it, he says it's your reasonable service. Reasonable, that's at least Here's what it really translates. That's the least thing you could do for it. At least you ought to do this. Oh, my goodness sakes. We're talking about consecration. We're talking about a false religion in the world captivating people because of consecration. And here we are who have the truth. We'll have a relationship oftentimes of lukewarmness, allowing the tares to come into our hearts, allowing that which would pollute us, allowing and dealing with stuff that's, let me tell you something, God wants a people who will consecrate themselves all the time to him and you become this living sacrifice. Doesn't mean it feels good. Doesn't mean you want to do it, but you do it because he is worthy of it and he calls it reasonable service. Come on, somebody. Tonight, before we go any further, I'm finished. Tomorrow, you're going to face a new day. Tuesday, you're going to face another day. Wednesday, you're facing another day. Thursday, Friday, Saturday. But here's my question to everybody that's in this room and even to myself. Well, each day will I consecrate myself to the Lord or will I go with the flow of the enemy and allow him to sow seeds that are in me that are tares that will bring poison to my home, my family, my ministry, my life, my marriage, my children, my destiny, my future. I want you to know something. You don't want that. I don't want that. None of us want that. And the way to do this is we need to be a people who are constantly, not just one time in our life, yes, one time to get saved, but then we make a commitment over and over again. Why? Because then we're reminded on a daily basis the commitment that I made to the Lord, it's as good today as it was 10 years ago. I haven't forgot that I've given him all of my heart. I haven't forgot that I've given him all of my life. And so tonight, we're having a consecration service. I said all of that just to bring you to the place we're having a consecration service where we commit our hearts and lives to Jesus once again, but first, I'm going to talk to those of you that have never done it, ever. And there's a bunch of you in here that have never given God all of your heart. You have never yet given God all of your life. And you know who you are. You're cool. That's great. You're nice. No one's mad at you. But did you know this? Jesus comes along and makes it very clear that in order for you to get to heaven and be right with God to get to heaven... You're going to have to be born again. When I say the words born again, people get mad. People get ugly. People say, I don't like that born again stuff. I don't even like born again people. You ever thought about why you don't like born again people? Because Hollywood portrays them in their movies like idiots and radicals and fanatics. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about consecration to the place where you become fanatical and crazy. I'm talking about consecration where you become healthy in Christ Jesus. There's a difference. And tonight there's some of you that haven't yet given God all of your heart. I'm going to deal with you first. 
First thing, right off the bat, if you haven't given God all of your heart and you haven't given God all of your life, tonight is your night of salvation. Somebody needs to stand before you, listen to me now, that loves you enough, stand before you that respects you enough, stands before you that honors you enough to stop playing church and tell you the truth. There's a day coming when the eastern sky is going to split. Jesus is coming and you know it. And you want to be right with him when he comes. You want to hear these words from Jesus. Well done, good and faithful servant. You do not want to hear, I do not know you. I want you to go from me, a worker of iniquity. And then those are the worst words you'll ever hear. But tonight you have an option. Tonight you can give God all of your heart. You can give God all of your life. In this safe and friendly place, we've sung songs, we've clapped our hands. You heard the word of God and you were great at what you heard. Tonight is your night of salvation. Tonight, your call. First thing is for those people that haven't yet given God all of your heart. I already know you know who he is in your head. You celebrate Christmas every year. You celebrate Easter every year. You know who Jesus is in your head, but that will not get you to heaven. Listen to me. The devil knows who Jesus is. So you knowing who Jesus is doesn't make you a Christian. The only way to become a Christian, Jesus said these words, John 3rd chapter, you must be born again. That means you're going to have to give God all of your heart. You're going to have to give God all of your life. That means you're going to make a consecration of all of your heart, all of your life, all of your plans to Jesus. Be born of the Spirit of God. You're coming out of the kingdom of darkness. You're coming into the kingdom of light. You're leaving the old ways and you're coming into the new ways. You're leaving the sinful life and going into the righteous life. And that's what this is all about. You say, well, Pastor, how do I do that, Pastor Jim? You got to do it God's way. Jesus said if you come, listen to these words. If you'll, if you'll, if you'll uh, give him all of your heart, if you'll give him all of your life, it's an all or nothing relationship, I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking, he says, I'm coming again. When I come, and you know he is, he says, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. That is a crude and rude and blunt statement. Jesus made the statement. I didn't make the statement. Jesus said, I will vomit you from my mouth. You know what he really just said? He really said people that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all. And when he comes, just like he, he's gonna gather up the tares and put them in a bundle and burn them and take all the wheat and bring them into his barn, I want you to know something. You will be gathered up and you will be burned. And God makes it very clear that tonight is your night of salvation. You gotta give God all of your heart. You gotta give God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. You say, wait a minute, pastor, I think I'm going to heaven. I'm a really good person. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because you're good? Nowhere, it's not in the Bible, you're not gonna make it. Some of you might say, I'm gonna go to heaven because I love God. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because you love God? It's not in the Bible. You're not gonna make it. Somebody needs to respect you enough to tell you the truth and stop playing church games with you and tell you like it really is. You say, Pastor, wait a minute. My mom and dad told me I was a Christian when I was a kid. They had me christened or baptized when I was a baby. I went to catechism class. I went to Sunday school class, Sabbath school class. They, I, 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 I put a cross or a St. Christopher around my neck when I was a child. Hey, I'm glad your parents did that. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that'll get you to heaven? The only way to get to heaven is Jesus' way. He said he is the way, the truth, and the life. Listen to these words. No man goes to the Father except by me. You can't get there your way. You can't get there my way. And you can't get there some well-meaning church committee's way. You're going to have to get there his way. And his way is you're going to have to give God all of your heart and give God. You know why you got to give it to him? Because he's not a thief to rob it from you. 
It's your heart and it's your life. You know why you got to give it to him? Because he's not a conniver to talk you out of it, a manipulator to make you do it. He doesn't do that. It's your call. It's your choice. You have to offer yourself up as a living sacrifice. He'll make you holy by his blood. That's what grace is all about. And you'll find yourself being born of the Spirit of God with a future not only on this earth, but also in heaven where God backs you. Tonight is your night of salvation. I'm dealing with you first. First of all, all of you that are in this room tonight that haven't yet given God all of your heart. You haven't given God all of your life. Oh, I already know. Again, you know him in your head. But it's not about, look at me now, look at me. It's not about what's in your head. It's about what you've done with your heart. Have you given him all of your heart? Have you given him all of your life? Tonight in this safe and friendly place, you can give him all of your heart. You can give him all of your life. You say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I do it? Let's do it God's way. Let's don't do it my way. Let's don't do it your way. Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. That's what Jesus said. If you confess me before men, I'm a man, I'll see you do it. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'll count to three in a moment like this. One, two, three. And then when I say three, I'll pop my hands together. Bang! You'll hear that sound. Bang! And your hand goes up. I'll see your hand. Do you know what you're saying by the raising of your hand? You're saying, I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. No, no. I want to give him all of my heart. I want to give him all of my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, and denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. You can put it right back down after I see it. How simple is that? Why? Because he said these words. If you confess me before men, I'm a man, I'll see it. I'll confess you before my Father as mine. Your call, sit there and do nothing, or give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. Some of you, this is a divine appointment. You didn't just get here because someone invited you. God knew before the foundation of the world you'd walk through those doors tonight. God knew the message that you would hear. This is a divine appointment you have with God. You've had a lot of appointments, doctors and attorneys, uh, governors and, and statesmen maybe, and mayors of cities maybe, uh, well, maybe plumbers and painters. But I'm here to tell you something. Listen closely. Tonight you have an appointment with God, a divine appointment. And God brought you here to get right with God, to give him all of your heart, to give him all of your life. It's called consecration to the Lord. Tonight, you can get born again. Yes, giving God all of your heart, headed for heaven and denying your presence in hell. It's your call. I can't make you do it. I can only tell you the truth. Now listen, these are all for those of you that have never given him all of your heart or maybe you did at one time at a Billy Graham crusade or maybe prayed at a harvest uh, a crusade but you never followed through with all of your heart, never followed through with all of your life. You just hope that little prayer, that you formula that you spoke out loud called a prayer. There's no magical abracadabra words that you can say to get saved. It's about giving God all of your heart. It's about giving God all of your life. Today is your day of salvation. In a moment, I'll count to three, pop my hands together. You've been running from God instead of to God. Hey, 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 I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your life, wherever you're at, I'm speaking to you. I won't embarrass you, but even if you are embarrassed, it'd be better to be embarrassed for a moment than to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever because you chose to make the wrong choice tonight. Tonight's your night. Get ready, I'm speaking to you. All across this auditorium, I'm counting to three, I've done my job. Now here it is, it's your job to offer yourself up as a living sacrifice to the Lord Jesus Christ. Here it is, one, two, three. Let me see your hands, let me see your hand. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you, back here, eight, 
9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Back over on that far side. Where are you? 18, 19, thank you. 20, 21, 22, 23, thank you. Back over here. Anybody else? Real quick, anybody else? There's 23 wise people. Where are you, 24 and 25? There's 24. Thank you. God bless you. Just going to go for God. Who cares what anybody thinks? This is your day. This is your time. This is your appointment with God. There's 24 of you. Where's 25? Can't you just feel there's 25? Thank you. There's 25 right there. God bless you. Let's give the Lord a great big praise for 25. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now listen closely to me. All 25 of you, if you raised your hand, you're serious about God. Once you get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible friend, get your stuff. Bring a friend if you need to. Want you to get out of your seat, all 25 of you, if you raise your hand. You don't get saved by raising your hand. I want you to get out of your seat, get in the aisle, meet me in front. We're going to pray and invite Jesus into our heart. No weird stuff goes on. If you're serious, I want nobody to leave during this period of time. Let's all stand and let the 25 people, or if you're 26 and didn't raise your hand, but you should have, you come too. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I give you my heart. I give you my soul. Come now, come, 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 come. All of you in front, there's more than 25. There's more like 30 of you. But listen to this. You got to do something. You, you guys are w walking up here like you're going to the morgue. You need to put a smile on your face. This is a good thing, not a bad thing. There's nobody going to beat you up, you know. You get, you get to get saved. <laughs> so put a smile on your face. It's great. I want you to look to the left right over here. This is Pastor Dave waving at you. Pastor Dave has been voted the coolest pastor in the entire church. Only one person that cast a vote, that was his wife. But nevertheless, he's really a good guy. No weird stuff goes on at all. He's gonna do three things. Three things he's gonna do. He's gonna pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart, number one. Number two, he's gonna give you some free information, some free literature that you can take home now that you're a Christian. You know, what does God want from you? What does God expect from you now that you're a Christian? You just read through that stuff. Third grade reading level. How do I know that? I wrote it. I don't think I read above a third grade reading level. So guess what? Easy stuff. Just read about what to do next. Third thing he's going to do is introduce you to a program that we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. They're, they're people that are your friends. They want to be your friends. They'll meet you before church service four times, four simple times so you can get encouraged. We don't want you to come forward tonight, fall through the cracks, go back, keep doing the same, same stuff you did before. We want to help you get strong. We want to help you get healthy in Jesus. We want to help you become a fighter of the things of God, not just a pawn of the devil. Let us help you. We're putting our application in to be your pastors. Probably no one has ever talked to you that way before. Nobody's probably ever looked you in the face and said, I, I want to be your pastor. Here, I'm putting my, my application in. I want to be your pastor. I'll tell you the truth. I'll tell you like it is. I'll be honest before you. We've had years, decades. We've had uh, a quarter of a century this church has been around, healthy and strong, going forward with Jesus. Let us help you get healthy and strong in Jesus. Okay, make a left turn. Follow Pastor Dave right over that way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.